Let's look at a less known type of Japanese weapon, the Nagamaki. Hey folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiatorial. Now, first up, this is a sword that has been sent to me for review by Shadow Dancer Swords. And a review will be forthcoming fairly soon on this. So this isn't a review, it's talking about the weapon type as an introduction to it. And it is called a Nagamaki. Now, excuse my pronunciation, I don't speak Japanese, but Nagamaki, my understanding, means long wrap. And that is a reference to the long grip. Now, the first thing I have to say is if you actually look at antique examples of Nagamaki and examples from museums or indeed examples in art, they vary a lot. Uh, so there isn't one specific type of Nagamaki. They vary in length. They vary in proportions. That is, the blade varies in length and the hilt varies in length. Their origin is also slightly ambiguous and mysterious. You read different things in different places. And fundamentally, we don't exactly know how they came about. And it could be that much like many European swords and pole arms, they didn't necessarily have one uh, kind of narrow line of evolution. It's entirely possible that they developed through a number of different reasons and from a number of different places. But fundamentally, one idea is that they developed from the large two-handed sword, sometimes known as Odashi or Nodachi, um, or uh, potentially very large Tachi, or from the Naginata, or from all of the above mixed together. So, let's unsheathe this beauty. Now, this is an absolutely gorgeous blade uh, with a very particular um, uh, kind of cross-section and style of blade, which we'll talk about in a second. But fundamentally, you can see that this is a relatively large sword. Okay, so this is a 32-inch blade, and it's, uh, I haven't actually measured the hilt, but it's about uh, 18 inches long. So it is a long um, hilt or long handle. If I just hold it up to the swords behind me, you will notice it is comparable in hilt length, even longer than some of these uh, big two-handed European swords here. So it's about the same as a Zweihander in terms of the, uh, uh, the actual hilt length. The blade, however, is not so long, and that is an important uh, sort of unifying characteristic of all the different types of Nagamaki. That is, that the hilt relative to the blade, uh, or suka relative to the uh, blade, is long. Okay, so it's got a relatively long hilt. Now, one thing I should mention is this isn't, in, uh, in general, I would say, a typical Nagamaki. So it is Sword Dancer's version of a Nagamaki, but actually this one is, uh, in terms of the suka, it actually has a style of hilt which is essentially that of a katana. And that is historically valid. There were historical examples that were mounted like this. Moreover, some Nagamaki that originally had longer um, longer hilts, longer suka on them, or indeed if they were naginata, were sometimes shorten, sh shortened down. So we do find naginaka, na naginata and nagamaki, sometimes they have their tangs uh, shortened and they have a shorter hilt mounted on, and they are made up into odachi or uh, tachi or katana, or it's kind of o katana, big katanas, in order to be used as more conventional swords. So. This is uh, Sword Dancer's replica of a Nagamaki, but it's not necessarily a typical Nagamaki because a typical Nagamaki usually has a longer hilt on it, or shaft if you want to call it that. Now, an interesting detail um, and a difference between the Naginata and the Nagamaki is the Nagamaki, uh, which again means long wrap, means that it does have a sword-like hilt. Conversely, a Naginata does not have a sword-like hilt. It has a polearm shaft. It has a shaft on it. Now, just to confuse things slightly, Naginata do often have a suba or guard up here. They don't always, but they do sometimes. But nevertheless, fundamentally, we should think of the Naginata as a form of glaive. It's a form of polearm. Now, that does mean that the usage is different because obviously with, uh, if I just put this sword down for a second, um, if we just grab a, uh, a, a, well, let's grab a spear here. Okay, I've got a European spear. If you've got something which has got a long shaft on it, you can slide both ends. And this was done in the martial arts that these were used with um, in the various uh, Ryu, Ryu um, schools of uh, swordsmanship or martial arts use in Japan, where they used Yari and Naginata. The weapon is slid uh, in the hands, both in, a, in attacking with one end, but also to bring the other end into play as well. So sometimes they're used at uh, close range, and sometimes the hand slid back and they're used at long range. 
So there is a lot of sliding on the shaft, so to speak. Now, that is not the case, really, with the Nagamaki, at least not to the same extent, uh, because you have a Suka Ito, you have a, Suka Ito, you have a wrap, um, much like a sword. And so quite physically, you've got a good grip on the weapon, but you're not able to slide the hands up and down as easily. And of course, you don't have as much length to play with. Now, admittedly, some Nagamaki have much longer handles than this. However, they're not particularly conducive to sliding up and down. Now, that being said, there is some degree of sliding up and down, just as we would see with the European Zweihander or Spadone, Montante, whatever you want to call it. Uh, for example, there are techniques where, for example, you might let go with the lead hand in order to get extra reach um, by just swinging with the rear hand. Um, and there are certainly techniques where you use the um, you use the suka, you use the grip or hilt of the weapon for hooking and even locks and throws and things like this as well. So this can be used in a variety of ways and obviously you can strike with the back end as well in close range, but fundamentally it has quite a different character and usage to it compared to the larger Naginata or pole weapon. So when were these Nagamaki used? Well, fundamentally it's believed that they started being used predominantly really in the Kamakura period, but uh, really as we go into the Sengoku, so if we're talking in European centuries, we're really talking about the very end of the 15th century, but really the 16th century, this famous period of um, warring states as before we get to Edo um, period, where basically uh, there was lots and lots of war. And if you're watching um, Shogun, for example, the series Shogun, so that's pretty much at the end of that period, towards the end of that period anyway. So looking in the century that led up to the show Shogun, this is when these were being used. But they certainly weren't standard weapons. They seem to have had a particular place on the battlefield. Um, now, one theory is that these were given to retainers, um, uh, basically spearmen, where and there was one source that basically says that if the spearman's not very good with their spear, you give them one of these. And in other words, you give them a different role. Now that's funny because that doesn't quite sit right with me because actually a spear is, I'm sure most of you will realize, a damn sight easier to use than a large sword. And actually, if we look at European warfare, we actually think, see things like the uh, Montante or Spyhander being used by elites actually um, it's not a standard weapon that you would give to standard foot soldiers standard foot soldiers you'd give them a halberd a bill a pike or a firearm or a bow you know a crossbow something like this standard mass rank things these are not standard mass rank weapons and in fact if we look at the very large chinese two-handed swords the very large forms of dao and jian in earlier periods going all the way back to the han dynasty we actually find there is a constant factor with large two-handed swords being given to bodyguards and elites. And it's exactly the same in China and in Europe as well. So I find it hard to believe that they would give something that's akin to a odachi or, or, or no dachi, um, you know, the nagamaki. I find it hard to believe that they would give them to kind of the worst of your foot soldiers, that doesn't quite sit right. So anyway, that's something that I think, if you know more about the subject, I'd love to see uh, you post below. But uh, so far, I think, hmm, I'd like to do some more research on that rather than just repeating uh, things that I have uh, read places. Because I have to say, unfortunately, and this is true of European, Japanese, Chinese, doesn't matter whatever of military history, you'll often find things written in, in books and on websites that make you go, hmm, if you know a bit more about the subject, it makes you question them. Anyway, moving on. So these were, it seems, by and large, they fulfilled a similar role to the Naganata. Okay. But let's think about this in practical terms for a second without even looking at sources. Fundamentally, this is a big chopping sword and we have, rec um, of course you can thrust with it, but it's fi primarily this is a, uh, this has got more cutting power than your standard katana. Uh, just to demonstrate, incidentally, the size difference, I actually have an antique katana here, uh, which is early Edo period. Um, so this is a genuine antique rather than the replica here. And you'll see, so that is a pretty typical sized katana. And underneath here, we've got the Nagamaki. So it, it's a noticeably longer blade, but it, perhaps more importantly, really, it's a noticeably bigger and heavier blade, uh, but also obviously a longer hilt as well. So just overall, it's just a much, much bigger sword. Okay, so this is a very powerful weapon and it obviously takes up more space than a katana or a kasashi, but 
It takes up an equal amount of space to something like some of the larger tachi that were around earlier, in early, early Kamakura, for example. Um, and equally, it takes up less space than a Naginata. So one basic logic uh, theory here is that these were weapons who were used probably by people who, for whatever reason, were either fighting in a place or a situation, uh, a context, um, where Naginata were perhaps a bit too big for that job. Okay, so example, fighting in urban environments, built up environments, perhaps on ships, um, perhaps in forests, this kind of thing, where essentially a long pole arm becomes a liability, but you still want something that's bigger or more powerful than a standard katana, okay? So in my view, that's, the, that's probably where they live, and it's very much similar, again, coming from studying European martial arts, it's a very similar place to which is occupied by the European Zweihand, a large two-handed sword, okay? So they're often given to bodyguards, they're often given to people who have a specific job on the battlefield, for example, to flank, flank attack people or uh, charge into the sides of pipe blocks and this kind of stuff, um, or defend bridges or fight on top of ships, on top of galleys, that was another important person to repel borders. So I think that's probably, my view is that's probably the area that these swords fulfill. And a possible kind of, a possible bit of um, anecdotal evidence as well is if we look at the development of Chinese swords, we actually see that um, we actually see that the Chinese emulate certain Japanese swords used by pirates or people that they were encountering, which are clearly the swords that they emulate are bigger than what we would standardly con standard consider a standardly sized katana. Um, so, if you look at some of the large Chinese two-handed um, uh, Dao, many of which LK Chen, for example, has replicated. They are big swords akin to this. They've got similar hilt length to this. Uh, forms of early forms of Miao Dao, essentially. Um, they've got large blades, large choppy blades, and they have long hilts. And I suspect that people like pirates, but were perhaps using these sorts of swords some of the time with a wakasashi as a backup, rather than thinking the standard samurai day show of katana and wakisashi. So that's that's a theory but needs more research. So just to talk briefly about this specific example, this isn't as I say a typical nagamaki. A typical nagamaki will, would have a um, shinogi zakuri style blade, pretty much similar to a katana but with a longer hilt than this. This is a relatively shorter hilt relative to a standard nagamaki. Um, and this particular style of blade is called an unakubi <laughs> uh, zukuri. But all you really need to know, unless you're particularly interested in the Japanese terms, in which case you can go and go and Google those things. Um, if you're particularly interested in this type of blade, this is fundamentally based on a naginata. Now, there are a few things which are characteristic about a naginata blade, or at least a, not all, but a standard naginata blade. So you have a uh, fuller or uh, bohi coming up here, and it ends in this particular little shape here. So we've essentially essentially got a back, uh, um, thick back, essentially a back sword blade coming up to this particular shape of end of fuller or bohi here and then it switches to a bevel at the back so it's now thin so if you can see here it goes from thick at the back to thin at the back okay so now we have essentially a ridge running up about two thirds towards the back of the blade here. So you've got a, an area here which has got really reduced resistance to cutting through targets. So this is a style of blade which is standard on a naginata, not usually on swords, but it was copied on swords and some naginata blades were made into swords to confuse matters further. But this style of blade is really, really well suited to cutting through things because of low resistance. You could argue that this portion of blade is weaker because we don't have the thick back that we do and have a standard katana blade. But then if we look at the kasaki or point up here, you will notice it doesn't have, it has a much more slender and pointed point. But if we look at the back, this is the important bit as far as uh, I'm concerned. Let's try and get the reflection in the light. If we look at the back, come on, focus. There we go. You will notice it goes from slim there we go, too thick. Okay, now this is very akin to a reinforced point as we find on certain European swords, Indian swords, Indian kata, rondel daggers, things like this. So essentially what you've done is this is a style of blade which has a stiff and strong 
portion of blade at the base, a fort in European fencing terms. Then it has a foible, which is very, very good for cutting with low resistance. Then it has a reinforced kisaki with a slender point for piercing, because obviously longer weapons, particularly pole arms like naginata, are going to be used for thrusting more, perhaps, than swords are in a Japanese context, but it has to be reinforced. So this whole area has the ham on, so this is all hardened up here, which comes around the tip, but this is a reinforced thickened point. Now that has also another benefit in terms of cutting because it means that your blade's relatively light here. It's a little bit like a Turkish kilich or pala actually. It's quite light here, and then it has a heavier tip which adds quite a lot of inertia towards the very tip of the weapon without the whole weapon being heavy. So you bring the weight down but have mass right at the tip, despite the fact it's pointy at the tip, because it's thicker cross section, it gives you weight at the tip to give more powerful cuts. So a very, very interesting blade form. And these were found on Nagamaki. Obviously it's the standard blade form for a Naginata. And as I say, you sometimes find this blade form, a Naginata style blade on Katana, um, sometimes made like that, made as a Katana with a Naginata style blade, but equally, you often find Naginata blades or Nagamaki blades shortened down to make into a katana. So, I hope that's been a somewhat interesting and useful introduction to the Nagamaki. This is, from Shadow Dancer, this is a, a, a review of this will be forthcoming. But just as a spoiler <laughs> to that, this is really, really nice. This is one of the nicest replica Japanese swords. Uh, this and the other one they've sent as well. There'll be another sword uh, being shown on here soon some of the nicest replica Japanese swords I have ever laid my hands on. Not to say they're perfect, there's some constructive feedback that I would have for them on this, some little things I would change, but really, really beautifully made. It's an L6 steel blade, uh, clay um, quenched, genuine ham on, traditionally hand forged, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's super sharp, super beautifully made, super tight. Um, but yeah, a few, review will be forthcoming soon. But an absolutely beautiful sword, and it enables me to get into talking about the Nagamaki and some more Japanese weapons again. Anyway, I hope that's been uh, interesting. As I say, this has been a light touch overview. You can find out a lot more in-depth information about the Nagamaki, which does, its use does, is preserved in some Japanese swordsmanship schools. Um, and there's some historical data written about them and their use and who used them and why and how, um, which you can find online. Um, so yeah, I hope this has been a useful introduction overview. I have been Matt Easton, I will continue to be, and hopefully I'll see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks.